the life and times of the Waltons, next on TNN. In the fall of 1972, CBS decided to risk going against the trend in television. They debuted a show that wasn't cool, sexy, or violent, and it became an American institution known as The Waltons. The series was based on its creator, Earl Hamner's early life. It was about a large, close-knit family that lived in a very small town in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. For nine years, the Waltons captured the hearts of its loyal viewers and a lot of prestigious awards along the way. It was not only quality television, but also just what audiences were waiting for, maybe even needing. Now, certainly when the show came along in the early 70s, it was the exact opposite of all the turmoil that was going on in the country at the time. And uh, just to return to a simpler and a, and a sweeter time. I think it was a healing show, primarily. I think it was, we were coming out of a decade of chaos at a time when so many families were cracking apart because kids were protesting the war, doing drugs, moving away from home, having alternative lifestyles that were complicated for families to understand. Ralph Way told me something that really was sweet. He said, there's a lot of guys who down in Venice and they're sort of a self-help group and... They sit there, and they're these tough old guys, and they sit and they sob for an hour every Thursday night watching the show. And I, and I said, that's strange. Why? He said, because they look at life the way it should be. It tapped into something that America was hungry for, and still is. At first, it seemed that nobody, even those involved, anticipated the success of the Waltons. The Waltons started out as a throwaway. I mean, it was up against uh, Mod Squad and Flip Wilson. It had no chance of making it. I mean, they wrote it off, and they were writing reviews like, this is a great show, but no one's ever going to watch it. But everybody, I mean, including myself and my agents, had said, this will last six weeks, maybe 13, where they usually cancel, and you'll be able to go back to New York. And that's one of the reasons I was willing to, uh, to test for it, because I knew I could make a little money and get back, get back home. So consequently, the network busied them. You know, network people do interfere, and uh, with the best of intentions. But uh, I think thinking that the Waltons had, didn't stand a chance, they let me alone, and I was able to tell the, the stories that I wanted to tell and present these people the way I knew them. When the series debuted, it was set in the 1930s, and the Walton family, like most of the rest of the country back then, was trying to survive the hardships of the Great Depression. People ask me, how could you write such fond memories of such a grim time? And the thing is, it wasn't a grim time for us. We were a sufficient family. Every Thanksgiving, my father would go out and shoot a turkey. <laughs> we, we had a cow. Uh, so that we had fresh milk and butter. I'm probably the only uh, writer in Hollywood who knows how to, to milk a cow, and certainly the only writer that I know of who's ever slaughtered a hog. So you see, my qualifications <laughs> of being a writer are very wide. The stories were told in the form of memories, with each episode starting with Earl Hamner's narration, giving a little family history, and setting up the theme of that night's show. Richard Thomas's character, John Boy, represented Earl Hamner in his youth. He was the oldest child in a large family with the dream of becoming a writer. Over the years, the series took the family from the Depression through World War II. But at its core, it's about the kind of experiences everyone shares. People died, people got sick, people graduated from school, people had success, people had failure. People had conflicts, the same as they do today. The series also proved that good acting and strong storytelling were still great ways to find an audience. The writing on the Waltons was incredible. The producers were amazing. 
and the actors were incredible. Richard, Ralph, Michael, Will, and Ellen were amazing. And the synergy that they had carried the show. And Richard was such a great actor and so young. I was basically born and raised into the world that John Boy would have given anything to leave home to become. <laughs> Not that he wanted to become an actor or performer, but, you know, I was born in New York City, uh, raised in New York City. I was the son of ballet dancers. I became an actor at the age of six, seven. I, 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 I moved in a circle of, uh, with, uh, as a child growing up of a great deal of cultural sophistication and, and you know, in a huge urban area. So <laughs> no two upbringings could have been farther from, from each other. Earl Hamner saw Richard in the film Red Sky of Morning and thought he had the ability to convey the intelligence and sensitivity he was looking for. I would look at Richard Thomas and as he was experiencing something on the screen, I would feel it as if I was experiencing it all over again. I must say Richard did a better job of being John Boy than I did. He, <laughs> he, was, uh, he was brilliant, I think. Richard Thomas was on the show for five seasons, directed several episodes, and then it came time for him to leave. I always planned to leave after five years. It was never, my original contract was a five-year contract. I never assumed it would go five years. At the age of 21, which is what I was when I started the show, five years is an eternity. Now it's a drop in the bucket. It was time for him to move on. After all, Earl Hamner moved away from the mountain to pursue his writing career, so it made perfect sense for John Boy to do the same. It took a big emotional toll. I never, never made me want to turn around and go back, but it was, it was, uh, it was devastating in its way. I mean, I was fine, but I missed it more than I thought I would. Anyone who watched Richard Thomas on The Waltons knows a lot about Earl Hamner's life as a young man in Virginia. He was born in the little town of Shiler in 1923 and was his parents' first of eight children. I wanted to write from the time I was conscious of myself as a person. And when I was six years old, I wrote a poem and got it published, as a matter of fact. And there was no hope for me after that. There was no question but what I was, a writer. And now I am 76 and still writing. Just like the Waltons, Earl Hamner's family struggled through the Depression. Luckily, a local doctor and his wife helped Earl get a scholarship to the University of Richmond. But soon he was drafted into World War II. I was right behind the front line, but I was never shot at. But while we, we were there, they began teaching us special. And I was taught to disarm landmines, where the life expectancy on the battlefield is something like 20 minutes. And uh, fortunately, some unit in Paris needed a typist. And boy, could I type. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was stationed then in Paris for the next two years. After the war, Earl was able to finish college at the University of Cincinnati, thanks to the GI Bill. He then began his career as a writer. In the mid-50s, I was working in New York. I had written several books by then, but I kept my job as a radio and television writer at NBC because the books were not enough to support a growing family and my, my by then my wife and I had two children and then in the late 50s television moved from New York to to the west coast and so we had to move with it and I like living in California it's an odd place but uh, <laughs> I enjoy it Earl wrote for several shows, including The Twilight Zone, but he always had the most success when he wrote about his family. His book, The Homecoming, became the television Christmas special that turned out to be the pilot for The Waltons. During and after The Waltons, Earl Hamner also wrote and produced several other shows, including Falcon Crest. He recently published a new book titled The Avocado Drive Zoo, but it's those stories of his family that continue to resonate across America and around the world. A 
Life and Times of the Waltons returns in a moment on TNN. By the end of the first season, the Waltons was a solid hit, had cleaned up at the Emmy Awards that year, and was becoming something more than just another TV show. I think I really knew that we had made it when we were parodied in Mad Magazine. I thought, well, that's it. We've, we've arrived. <laughs> and, you know, and pretty soon, um, on all kinds of shows, mostly comedy shows, you'd hear people saying goodnight to each other. Goodnight, Mama. Night, Ben. Night, Jim Bob. Night, Mama. Night, Aaron. Night, Jim Bob. The house that we lived in was very small, and we could hear each other all over the house. And uh, I don't know how it started, but one night, one of the kids called goodnight to somebody in another room. And then someone would call back. And before you know it, there was a whole chorus of good nights going on all over the house. And we would have kept it up till dawn, except my father would finally yawn and say, all right, that's enough. <laughs> and we, we would say one last good night. The characters, modeled after Earl's parents, were played by Michael Learned and Ralph Waite. Michael Learned, a skilled and accomplished stage and television actress, was cast to play Olivia Walton. She had been born in Washington, D.C., and by age 10 was attending school in England, where her interest in acting developed. Michael was in her early 30s when she started playing Olivia Walton. She wasn't really old enough to be Richard's mother, so she was like a mother, but a friend as well. And Michael always was making me laugh because I had to sit next to her at the dinner table. And when Ralph would make her laugh, she would squeeze my hand during the prayer. And I knew she was laughing. And then I would laugh. And of course, she was a professional, so she never started to laugh. And I always got in trouble. <laughs> Michael Learned won three Emmy Awards for her portrayal of Olivia Walton. After seven years on the series, she left to pursue other acting opportunities. On the show, her absence was explained as a prolonged cure for tuberculosis. She made occasional appearances while the series was still in production and was in the three Walton's reunion specials made during the 1990s. Unlike Michael Learned, Ralph Waite discovered acting fairly late in life. He was born in White Plains, New York in 1928 and was the oldest of five children. When he was attending college, his parents died, and he was launched into a difficult journey of personal discovery. He went home to help his youngest siblings, then became a minister for about five years. Still unfulfilled, he then jumped into becoming a publicity director for a publisher in New York. I was drinking more and more. I got into some very tr serious trouble over the years, drinking and living it up and being restless and being ill at ease. And eventually, uh, all this, uh, I split from my family. We got a divorce. It was when Ralph was in his early 30s that he began taking acting classes. And he decided to change professions again. In the 1960s, he found work on Broadway and in movies, including Cool Hand Luke. Then, after Henry Fonda turned it down, Ralph was offered the role of John Walton. The impact on the Waltons, of course, is... It's tremendous in my life. I mean, it changed everything. Uh, I made good money for the first time in my life. I became, quote, famous. But most importantly, I was with a group of people and doing scenes and telling stories in which I was a very loving and kind and responsible human being. And I had gotten so far away from that in my childhood as I helped raise my brothers and sisters. I had been a caring kind of guy and really took care of business as best I could. What with the drinking and with the acting and with running all over the country and with uh, acting up and thinking I was a, uh, a wild man, which I guess I was, and I couldn't believe that they hired me. You're a hard man to harness, John Walton. You did it. <laughs> and as I played John Walton over the years, all of those impulses and qualities that were in me early on were reawakened, and all the destructive behavior became less and less powerful in my life. So, in a way, uh, I became John Walton. What's going on around here, Liv? It's like a bunch of stuffed owls to me. Ralph Waite seemed to catch that combination of mischievousness and compassion and, and masculinity and all those lovely things that my father was. Um, 
Actors give us great gifts, and Ralph gave me the terrific gift of portraying my father the way he did. The Life and Times of the Waltons returns in a moment on TNN. One reason that the Waltons appealed to such a broad audience is because it was about a multi-generational family. Children loved to see what the Waltons' kids were up to. Parents could relate to the struggles and joys John and Olivia Walton went through. Older audiences could not only revisit the 1930s, but enjoy the performances of two Hollywood veterans, Ellen Corby and Will Gear. Earl Hamner's respect for his real grandparents made him want to include them in the series. And Ellen Corby and Will Gear turned them into two of the most memorable and beloved characters on the show. Ellen was a very determined woman, but the first time I saw her play Grandma, I went to her after the scene and said, Ellen, that's much too brittle, much too harsh. My own grandmother, who's the basis for the character, was a much sweeter woman. And Ellen said, young man, you've got an awful lot of really nice people here, and it's going to get terribly saccharine if you let everybody be sweetness and light. And she said, I'm going to give you some, some tartness. And she did. I think Ellen Corby and Will Gear were the most remarkably cast grandma, grandpa I've ever seen on television. She and Will's uh, relationship on camera was not unlike their relationship off camera. Ellen would tend to get a little annoyed with Will Gear because he'd get so exuberant, and Ellen and he would, have, would snip at each other a little bit, although he never snipped back, actually. But Ellen was such a professional, and everybody was, uh, respected her and was a little intimidated by her in the early days, because she had been around forever. Ellen Corby was born Ellen Hansen on June 3, 1911, in Racine, Wisconsin. Early on, she wanted to perform, but when she came to Hollywood, she started out behind the scenes. Ellen Corby and I became great friends because she said, I was a script girl to your father, Tex Ritter, on several of his westerns. And she was also a script girl for um, Laurel and Hardy, or Stan and Babe, as she called him. And she was right in the middle of that. And then finally, she became an actress. Ellen was soon in demand as a character actress in Hollywood, with credits that included the classics It's a Wonderful Life and Sabrina. But she'll always be remembered as Grandma Walton. Ellen Corby was our grandmother. We called her grandma. Ellen adopted us. She never had children of her own, and so she immediately became a grandmother of seven children, so I think she really liked that. Ellen Corby won many awards for her portrayal, including several Emmys for Best Supporting Actress. Her greatest challenge came five years into the series when she suffered a serious stroke that she would never fully recover from. When Ellen had her stroke, she was away from the show for a while, and then they had her come back playing grandma as a stroke victim, which was, uh, I think, a very courageous thing for the show and, and for Ellen. Sit down. Let's try a duet. Oh, no. No, I'm not going to let you get away with It's what everybody wanted, and, and I think it was a great, honest thing to do. One hand is all you need. Ellen was an amazing fighter and was an inspiration for so many stroke survivors to keep going and to fight. And up until the day she died, she got letters and letters and letters thanking her for her show of strength. Ellen Corby continued to play Grandma Walton through the rest of the series and in the three reunion specials in the 1990s. Sadly, Ellen Corby, at age 87, passed away in early 1999. Will Gear was one of my favorite people in the world. He uh, was in his 70s when he came to the show, and at the top of a very distinguished career in vaudeville and on the stage and in films. Uh, he had just done a movie called Jeremiah Johnson with Robert Redford. But when he came to our show, he didn't have to act. Will was simply himself. The person that we saw playing Grandpa was simply Will having a wonderful time. William Gear was born on March 9, 1902 in Frankfort, Indiana. 
When he went away to school at the University of Chicago, he got a degree in horticulture, but also started acting in plays. He spent his early years after college uh, in tent shows. Today, that would be compared to, say, summer stock. It's a wonderful commercial kind of thing. You know, the boats would go down the river, they'd get off, and they'd perform. And it's a way to cut your teeth that is so important for an actor. Will made his way to the New York stage and then to Hollywood where his career in film took off. Then, in early 1951, Will Gear got caught up in the communist witch hunt led by Senator Joseph McCarthy, known in Hollywood as the Blacklist. He was called before the House Un-American Activities Committee, and like so many others, a member of the Communist Party. being accused made you guilty. His name was taken off all billboards, and there is no more salary, everything was dropped. And we came back to our Santa Monica home, and nobody wanted us. And we had to go away in isolation, because it was becoming too cruel for his family, the way we were treated. And uh, we moved up to Topanga Canyon, which was, uh, at that time, it would take about an hour to get there, because you didn't have a freeway. There was only well water. We used to go to school kind of orange, because it was well water, you know, to wash yourself. And uh, we had animals, and we lived off our chickens and our goats. And uh, it was sort of like <laughs> the Waltons. <laughs> it took him a long time to get back on his feet. But he went through this process without bitterness. That was the extraordinary thing about Will Gear. Will Gear rebuilt his career on stage, in film, and on television during the 60s. Then the producers of the Waltons gave him a chance to become America's favorite grandfather. It was a marvelous period of his life. It was a safe period of his life. With it, he was able to build, again, the thing that he loved, a repertory company, the Will Gear Theatrical Botanicum. And uh, that always sustained him, and also a place to have his gardens. So he had everything at the end of his life which was very important, and I thank Earl Hamner for that. He had his, his commercial success, his greatest commercial success, which was Grandpa Walton. He had his gardens, and he had his theater. And so he went out on a golden star. It was during the break after the sixth season that Will Gear passed away at the age of 76. His family was all around him. His ashes are buried on the grounds of his beloved Theatricum Botanicum in Topanga Canyon. And we have a beautiful bust of Papa in the garden. And I'm sure he's very, very happy with all the flourishing around that goes on out there. When the seventh season began, once again, reality and the fiction of the Waltons blended into unforgettable television. When we resumed shooting, the first episode was a tribute to him. And we all went up on the mountain to say goodbye. Will died a couple of weeks after my own father died. So that was very tough for me. I feel like I lost my father and my grandfather within a month. And um, coming back and doing the episode where we all paid tribute to him in our own way was, was a great way to, to say goodbye and to have closure. I remember feeling a lot of, of sadness when we filmed that. It was very strange, uh, very surreal, because uh, we were truly, truly touched by by him as an individual, as a cast member, and, and uh, as a friend. The Life and Times of the Waltons returns in a moment on TNN. The Waltons premiered Thursday nights on CBS back in 1972. Our competition, The Flip Wilson Show and Mod Squad. Stay with us. During the run of the series, the back lot and sound stages of the Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, California, substituted for the mountains of Virginia. It was here that the actors playing the Waltons evolved into their own kind of family. I think the relationships on the Waltons were very strong and grew stronger over the years. After all, uh, we spent as much time, more time together, actually, than we did with our own families in real life. I mean, you're together 12, 14 hours a day for 10 years. 
I think the dynamics are every bit as complex and as interesting as dynamics in a, in a family. And I think that is what came across. And in its authentic form, those feelings are irresistible. That's why, no matter how corny they thought it might have been, or how nostalgic, or how naive, or all the things, though, the ways in which the Waltons could be criticized, theoretically, you could never argue with what was really there. I think as the kids, we always liked to have times when we got to play. And there was a time when we got to go into the pond. Last one in has to hang up all the time. <laughs> and whenever we got to put on these 1930s bathing suits and play, that was, that was the most fun that we had. Things were really fun on the set. I mean, it got, it got pretty wacky. There were long days. And especially in those kitchen scenes, we would sit there on the dinner table for hours. And after a while, especially in the afternoon, there was a real lack of oxygen there. And I think it, it made us all giddy. So pretty soon we'd all be laughing. Can we talk? As long as you mind your manners. And no tickling at the table. And I think that energy that we had, that you know, goofing around that we did, right up until the word action, gave us a nice flow of energy. Who's ready for swim? The kids came across as, as real kids because we were, and we were just being ourselves, which I think is probably the key to acting anyway. The kids uh, on the Waltons, in the beginning, uh, we were looking just for kids that would just match if they all had red hair. But uh, fortunately, each of them had their own special quality. Mary McDonough, who played Aaron Walton, was born in the San Fernando Valley in 1961, only a few miles from where the Waltons would later be filmed. I went on my very first audition for The Homecoming, which was the Christmas story, which turned out to be the pilot for the show. And I was nine years old, and I got it. And that was, uh, that was history. The other kids, like Judy Norton, had some acting experience or training before being cast in the roles that would make them famous. Eric Scott, who played Ben Walton, began his career at age six when he started doing print ads and commercials. Soon he was playing roles in shows of the era like Bewitched. He was 12 when he became part of the Walton clan. The second oldest boy in the family, Jason, was played by John Walmsley. This icon of the all-American family was actually born in 1956 in Lancashire, England. His family moved to California when he was still a toddler. When I was eight, I started playing the guitar. And uh, not long after that, I was performing, and I did an amateur show for kids and was seen by some producers and invited to audition for a movie they were producing. John didn't get that part, but he did get an agent and was soon going on interviews all over Hollywood. I did a lot of guest shots on different series. Uh, Combat, My Three Sons, Daniel Boone, Nanny and the Professor. But actually, I would guess one of my biggest breaks as a kid was a movie at Disney. It was called The One and Only Genuine Original Family Band. While he was working at Disney, they knew he was English, so they asked him to be the voice of Christopher Robin in the Academy Award-winning Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day. When he started work on the Waltons, John's musical background became an integral part of his character as he grew up on the show. He was given his high school diploma on the set, and John and his character Jason managed to fall in love with the same girl. Her name was Tony on the show, and Lisa Harrison in real life. We were introduced by a, a mutual friend who had done a guest shot. And uh, we met and immediately started singing together. And we had a band, the Walmsley Harrison Band. Uh, did a lot of TV shows and fairs, and amusement parks, things like that. And the producers wrote a character for Jason's girlfriend. And Lisa auditioned for the part. and got the role. John's wedding proves what a family affair the Waltons cast had become. The ceremony was held in Michael Learned's backyard, and Ralph Waite, still a minister, performed the ceremony. When the series was coming to an end, Ralph Waite and Michael Learned were worried that it would have a detrimental effect on the kids. So I think they, they spent a lot of time with the kids, uh, preparing them when they wouldn't be seeing each other every day. 
after the show, I mainly concentrated on my music, which is still my first love. I worked with some people like Richard Marks and did a couple of world tours with him. Mary McDonough went to college after the series, was married, and is now raising a daughter. She continues to act and recently played a character on ER that was suffering from lupus, a disease she was diagnosed with about four years ago. I lobby Congress, and I work for women's groups, and I try and educate people about, about the disease as much as possible. So I try to take a, a challenging situation and turn it into something positive. Judy Norton now lives in Vancouver, Canada. She still acts and runs an acting school. She is also raising a son. Eric Scott decided to build a more secure career outside of show business. He's now the vice president of a growing courier company that returns to the role of Ben for the reunion movies. Fans who have followed the lives of the stars of the Waltons know that Eric suffered a tragic loss seven years ago when his wife died right after giving birth to their daughter, Ashley. She was diagnosed with leukemia on a Monday. We uh, extracted Ashley's C-section on Tuesday, and Thursday morning at 10.30, she passed away. So in a period of 72 hours, I went from uh, having a very, very happy, normal a nine-month pregnant wife to uh, being a father and a, a widower. Eric dedicated himself to raising his daughter alone for the last seven years. Now, happily, Eric is engaged and will soon be married. As far as the youngest kids on the show are concerned, David Harper is an artist living in Southern California, and Cami Kotler now lives in Virginia. She is raising her family not all that far from where the family that inspired the Waltons lived. The Life and Times of the Waltons returns in a moment on TNN. Aside from the Waltons family itself, Waltons Mountain was home to plenty of colorful characters. Joe Conley played general store owner Ike Godsey. The specific character in the beginning was just a friendly, good old boy. As the show went on, uh, and I became more ingrained into the, uh, the stories, the character got stronger. And he was the only man who owned a store in the whole area. Outstandingly honest, very moral, as were all the Waltons. Quite a nice man. People say that I put a lot of myself uh, in the character, and uh, I hope that's true. Joe was born in Buffalo, New York in 1928. His family background may have helped him be the perfect actor to play Ike. His grandfather was a traveling salesman known as Snake Oil Johnny. His mother was a performer in vaudeville. Joe started performing locally at age six. After high school, he moved out to California to go to college. But even though he had been too young to be drafted during World War II, he had to leave college to serve as part of the occupying army in post-war Japan. After his tour of duty, he went back to complete his education. I finished college, graduated in 1951. The Korean War had just broken out the previous year and I was called back into the service. And I was a big time second lieutenant. And I was in combat, and in October, I got wounded. Joe was awarded a Purple Heart and Silver Star for his service to his country. He returned to Los Angeles to pursue an acting career. Soon, he was a familiar face on TV shows and hundreds of commercials, all leading up to his role as America's best-known general store owner. During the first few seasons, Walton's audiences also got to see a young actor named John Ritter begin on his road to stardom. John was one of the most delightful characters we had on the show ever. Uh, he played a young minister named Reverend Fordwick, a young Baptist minister starting out in a very conservative area. He made it a funny character because he was so straight-laced and yet so innocent and so, I mean, it's so tortured and so narrow and so i mean he was a great vivid character to create. His physical comedy and his sense of the outrageous was already so highly developed neighbors and friends i want to thank and his just simple madness 
was <laughs> part of his charm. John had attended USC as a drama major and had primarily done stage work prior to the Waltons. Playing a reverend was something new for him, but he got plenty of support on the set. Matt Fordwick here is a trained preacher. He's trained to preach the word of the Lord. Ralph Waite was a minister before he was an actor, and he helped me a lot with my character about doing the things authentically, which I really wanted to. The only two people who knew every hymn were Will Gear and Ellen Corby. Just as I am without one plea. They knew every lyric, every song that, you know, you could possibly have in a hymnal. After a few seasons, John Ritter was offered the lead in a new series, an offer no actor can refuse. The only thing that was bad about me getting the lead on Three's Company was that I knew I'd have to leave the Waltons. That was, that was it, and I really hated to say goodbye because it, uh, it was such a joy every time I got to come on the set. So much fun, so much fun. Another person Earl Hamner knew when he was growing up became the Walton's neighbor, Verdi Grant. This reoccurring character was played by stage and television actress Lynn Hamilton. Oh, my. I was born in Yazoo City, Mississippi, which is a little town about that large. <laughs> uh, and down in the Delta. And... Um, I always wanted to be an actress. I'm told that my, my mom tells me that when I was three, I said I wanted to be an actress, and she couldn't figure out where that came from because this was before television. Later, we moved to Chicago. I went to the Goodman Theater, which is one of the finest drama schools in the country. It's a part of Chicago's Art Institute. But there simply weren't any roles for me. I'm talking about the 50s. I finally had a chance to do a play my third year in the drama school. And they put white face makeup on me. Can you believe it? <laughs> Lynn modeled for a while, and in the 60s, her stage career took off. She then came to California and has worked continually in shows from Sanford and Son up to The Practice. But the character she played on The Waltons has a special place in her heart. Bertie Grant was a very industrious, proud lady who lived on the mountain. She had no education. She was self-taught. She had, as my mom would say, good common sense. <laughs> but what we didn't know is that she was harboring the secret. She was illiterate. She could not read or write. And John Boy teaches her how to read. And a whole new world opens up for her. As a result of doing that show, I think it had such an influence on so many people because I received letters all through the years saying that students, children, boys and girls, and even young adults, and even older people have gone back to school to learn how to read, recognizing the value of an education as a result of that show. The Waltons was such a, a spirit-lifting, heartwarming piece, and preached love and compassion and brotherhood it was a very special show. The Life and Times of the Waltons returns in a moment on TNN. You're watching The Life and Times of the Waltons on TNN. With the success of the Waltons, Earl Hamner had put his little hometown on the map and put the spotlight on his family. I give him credit that Earl wanted to share his family with the American public, but that's really what he really did. I mean, he was just, I'm amazed they still talk to him. <laughs> My brother Jim is a little annoyed when uh, tourists come into his yard or knock on the door and want his autograph, and he's photographed constantly. When my mother was alive, she used to delight in the tourists who would show up there. She would serve them tea <laughs> and, have, and ask them in the house. But when her tea bill got ex exorbitant, I advised her not to do that anymore. But she loved people. Now there's another destination for fans making the pilgrimage to Walton's Mountain. An abandoned schoolhouse was turned into the Walton's Mountain Museum. It's filled with memorabilia and features rooms recreated from the sets. When Earl and the cast came to opening day, it caught everyone a little off guard. This is totally overwhelming. We thought it was going to be a little function where we would show up and 6,000 people turned out. 
And then they had to turn thousands of people away because the town is so small. CBS realized there was still interest in the Waltons and ended up airing three reunion movies in the 1990s. It's interesting to do a reunion show because you it's been a year or two since you might have seen them and then all of a sudden you're walking down these dirt roads on the back lot which is right outside of the mill the 70s and 80s come back with power and these kids are now all grown and it's a weird it's like life well, i think reunions are basically an opportunity for the public to see how old and fat everybody has gotten <laughs> And I had gotten quite a bit older, a hell of a lot fatter than the first one. No, I, um, it was great. I hope there'll be another reunion. CBS has a, a really fine script, which treats the Waltons very, in a much more recent time. And uh, after everybody's grown up and they all have children, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll get to do another reunion. It would be great fun to get that group of bandits together again. While fans all over the world are all hoping that the television saga of the Walton family isn't over, the cast did recently reunite for another reason. My favorite project in the last year was producing the Walton's Christmas album, which is called A Walton's Christmas Together Again. And uh, we all got together and sang a lot of old songs and some new songs, and a few of which I wrote, and um, just had a great time. Loyal followers of the series will undoubtedly make the Walton's Christmas CD a holiday tradition, while reruns of the series continue to find new audiences. There's something comforting about the Waltons. By the end of each episode, problems had been solved and the family had persevered. Earl Hamner's closing narration would sum it all up. It's a television tradition that's worth honoring. There was a very moving uh, moment on one of our episodes called The Founder's Day, and I think it sums up a great deal of how I feel about my family and growing up in Virginia. I have walked the land in the footsteps of my fathers, back in time to where the first one trod and stopped, saw sky, felt wind, bent to touch Mother Earth, and call this home. Father, mother, grow to the sons and daughters to walk the old paths to look back in pride and honored heritage, to hear its laughter and its song, to grow, to stand and be themselves, one day remembered. I have walked the land in the footsteps of my fathers. I saw yesterday and now look to tomorrow. Ain't that pretty? This week, experience the warmth of America's favorite TV family. Surprise! Hosted by original cast member Richard Thomas. Join me for a week of Walton's Movie Memories. All this week right here on TNN.